Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Teacher's Point of View. Uh, got uh, an exciting principal on the episode uh, today. He's part of a multi-academy trust, but his, his name's Liam Collins, who's the, the principal of Arc Alexandra in East Sussex, in, in, in obviously, England. Um, I mean, Liam, welcome. Right, if you could just kind of start us off by introducing yourself and kind of the journey you've had in education, that'd be awesome. Uh, yeah, so, uh, hello, I'm Liam Collins. I'm principal of Arc Alexandra. Uh, down in Hastings. Um, previous two years before that, I was director of curriculum for a multi-academy trust called GLF. Uh, but although I love the challenge of the role, I missed working directly with young people and teachers. Uh, before that, I was a head teacher for six years at a school in the north of this county, um, a school called Uplands Community College. And then um, the kind of route of vice principals, uh, deputy heads and so on before that part. Um, but came into teaching late, came into teaching at 29 um, through a long and winding road of lots of different roles, but walked into a classroom uh, and loved it from the first moment I walked in and really have never looked back. Fantastic. I mean, it's, it's amazing how you've got to where you've got to. I mean, like in terms of obviously since you've started teaching to, to kind of where education is now, I mean, like how much do you feel it's progressed in your time in, in sort of, yeah, in your in your teaching career so far? I think in terms of um, what is teaching um, and what is learning, I think we are light years ahead of where, where we were when I started in the profession. I think the understanding of what makes um, a really good series of lessons, I think, is well known now. And I think um, that concept of keeping things as simple as you possibly can uh, whilst being as effective as you possibly can, I think is is pretty much now embedded in teaching, and it's it's certainly what I see. Um, but we understand um, the elements that make a great lesson and get uh, students understanding what we're trying to teach them. I think there's still a long way for us to go in terms of cognitive overload, uh, and that's not just the students. I think it's us as well in terms of we're constantly trying to do too many things at once. Um, and I think that's probably the next stage is, is, is the real deep understanding of, of teachers of, of, of cognitive um, overload and holding the six things in the forefront of your mind and so on. That to me is the next, is the, is the next leap. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you mean by that in terms of like kind of embrace, I mean, kind of changing the cognitive approach in, in what we do in terms of teaching? Well, I mean, there's so many parts to it, isn't it? it, it it's the first um, part is understanding that learning only happens when you've truly forgotten something. Uh, and that's quite hard at times for students to understand that, that they won't know that they've learned it until they've forgotten it. And that kind of recapping and going back over things and building the, the, the synapses um, between the cognitive part of your mind and to the bits where you store things, making your brain aware that you've got to store this. You know, that's quite a big part of what we do in terms of um, learning is that our brains make a distinct choice that I need to recall this. And therefore, you, you hold on to it. Otherwise, your brain is amazingly efficient at just throwing it all away and never coming back to it. Um, but that idea that you can only hold six things really at the forefront in your cognitive mind is the thing that we've got to start thinking about in terms of lessons. So if there's any kind of anxiety going into a lesson, into a lesson that's one thing gone. If there's, um, oh God, this is maths and I'm terrible at maths, that's the second thing, cognitive part of your brain gone. Then you get a problem on algebra and it's something, you know, oh, I definitely don't like algebra and there's another two gone. And it's us understanding those things of making sure that the students come in and are able to approach the problems that we give them in a the lesson with all of that, uh, mind open to solve the problem um, and not overloading them with oh here's another thing and, and here's another thing let's make sure that we've embedded the thing that we're learning first to allow you to to expand what you're doing after that part so I am a great believer in um, the understanding that there's that knowledge is really really important uh, as a starting point um, because I think that does give you the baseline to take you into the next into the next stages Sure. I mean, it, it's obviously, I, I agree. I think knowledge should be the starting point. Sometimes it does feel like in education, 
knowledge is almost a destination with the way that we have centralized exams and it's very much focused on i mean you learn two years worth of information and then you put it down in in an hour hour and a half um yeah like, you know, like, I mean, uh, like, did, is that a system that kind of is working for as effectively as it could be for these children? I think, I don't think so. I think if you, if you study um, education systems across the planet and you start to understand that the, the why of education is, is very different. Um, and one of the whys of education is how do we make our, um, our community um, the best it can be in terms of the first part of their ed educated life. Um, and that means kind of really thinking about how, how wide your curriculum is and how much knowledge you're trying to uh, enable students to understand. And I think there's been this battle at times. And I look at the maths curriculum in particular, and I think there's been a real academic battle somewhere about what has to go into the maths curriculum, which means it is just enormous. Um, and that's quite hard to get through to some students in terms of what they're going to be studying. And I think there is an academic element to maths, which I think all students should do. And there should be a vocational element to maths, um, so numeracy, in the same way that we have English language and English literature. I think there, you know, there was one simple change that I would make very quickly is I would, I would have two maths GCSEs, one that had the academic and the beauty in it, because I think it's important, like literature is important, that you understand that this is where it can go. But the other side of it should be about ensuring that um, people can, are numerate, which I think is, again, is, is such an important part of their lives. Mm -hmm. But within that, I would have a heavier focus on statistics. And I'd probably, oh, really? have, a, a, I'd probably have a heavier focus on uh, banking and finance as part of, as part of that mathematics. Absolutely. I mean, I, I love that because I mean, I'm a, I'm a big advocate that there is uh, obviously I understand the importance of mathematics and English and science. Right. But there is this level of actually in maths. Are we actually doing enough to prepare kids with numerate skills that are going to be relevant to the real world? Because I never got taught, uh, taught how to save up for a mortgage. I never knew how interest rates worked. I never knew how to, like loans worked, how student loan worked. I mean, I thought it was zero percent interest um, when, when I went into uni. You know, um, yeah. I'm sure it changed. I mean, I'm sure they robbed me, but um, but ultimately there is this level of kind of just teaching maths because of the knowledge. And actually, some kids are never going to take maths like beyond GCSEs, right? So like uh, to, to, to do like get them to do quadratic equations and all of this sort of stuff at an advanced level when actually they're probably never going to use it unless they put a ladder up against the wall i mean is there is there a trick we're missing here i mean like could could we develop that i mean how far away are we from actually like preparing kids fine like in terms of that financial side of maths um to, to actually get them ready for the real world well you have to ultimately you have to make a distinctive decision within your curriculum if you're going to do that and so i was very lucky in one of the schools that i taught at because it was had a business and enterprise specialism we did a, man, a money matters course with all of the students in year eight um, um and i thought that was a really great course to give them that introduction into the key things that they need to know but like everything you know by the time they end of year 11 and by the time they get a mortgage you know have they remembered all the things that you were teaching them it it's a difficult one, but, you know, just understanding APR, just understanding interest rates, just understanding, you know, um, you can buy this thing today, but that's going to mean you're going to need to pay it back at £100 a month for the rest of, you know, the next two years. Or you can put the 80 quid a month away in a savings account over that same time, uh, and probably not at the moment, but you start to earn enough interest that then, get you to the point of the, co the cost of the thing that you had in the first place i think it's just simple parts like that but again you know we we live in a, we live in a society which is very much about the now and buying the things now rather than you know um the way that my parents did it which was by saving up and by you know um taking care over things and not throwing things away and getting them repaired um but going back to the school side of things it, it's a difficult one because if we put everything that we think should be in the curriculum into the curriculum, um, we would probably need 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year. Because it does feel like every time something happens, someone will say, well, it should be in the curriculum. You know, so um, where we're, you know, we're talking about obesity. So every student should be running a mile every single day. 
you know that that was the that was the outcome to to a lot of that thing. You're thinking, well, okay, that's great. I can't, you know, it's difficult to work out how I'm going to get fourteen hundred students running a mile every single day. Um, so okay, we should teach them that. Okay, so we used to teach them that in in food lessons and and, and so on, but they were deemed less academic. So you know, lots of those things have, have kind of disappeared. I think if, I, if I'm going to be honest, there's a, there's a real moment where um, school used to finish and parenting used to start. And I think there's something that's been lost in that, in that regard in terms of um, the part of this is, is about us as parents, making sure that our children are aware of these, these things. And we can't just shove everything into a curriculum and say, oh, you should be doing that um, in school because we do have to do the maths. We do have to do the English. I think it's important to do science and humanities and so on. I think that's what we're we're here for. Yeah, I mean, I, I get I, I get what you're saying, and I, I do, there is an element that schools should teach children the basic skills so that they are prepared for life. But actually, I mean, we we've got so much content that is not actually preparing children for real life. You know, I mean, I know some some people would argue that there's a lot in there that's important, but actually, we we ask adults at the age of 18 to vote every single year but not we don't teach all the kids what it actually means to vote and how politics works and actually how to read like um like the manifesto that comes out you know and and how policies work i mean there, there's so much that we're teaching them and then there's so much that we're not teaching them you know that is actually relevant to the real world like are we are we working on emotional intelligence emotional regulation presentation oral skills um like just kind of collaborating I, I, like i mean do you know what i mean there's so much in the 21st century that we're not yeah. we're not doing i mean i get obviously we have a lot of content but what what do we need to do to actually like kind of have a hybrid model so to speak so we can actually get the best of both worlds i think i think i, I have to say i think the best schools do get uh, the best of both worlds i think you do see um schools and you know within my own trust you see that there are lots of things that we do together which are things like public speaking competitions and debating competitions and you know, um, as someone that used to teach law, I'm really keen to do mock trials within the school that, I, that, that I'm in. Um, it is so important that they have that oracy and they understand that importance of spoken language. Um, you know, and it's, it's one of the key um, parts of the vision going forward to next year is that, is the, is the deliberate teaching of reading first and foremost to make sure that the students can uh, read a passage, decode a passage, and building on the fantastic work that our primary schools have done over a number of years. But it's also about um, students being able to talk to each other and being able to debate with each other and being able to um, ask difficult questions of teachers in lessons about uh, the world and how it operates. Um, but there is a, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a national um, malaise a little bit in terms of politics and, and so on. Um, you know, you only have to look at the turnout at a general election to know that there's, you know, there's not enough people voting. Um, and it, again, it's a really, it's a really difficult one because do we teach them it, um, and they they know it inside and out, but actually they're just not inspired by what they're seeing politically, or is it that we should, you know, if they were inspired politically, they wouldn't need that much teaching because they would be out and you know getting themselves involved and and so on. I think. Sometimes we see that. I think the um, the uh, the kind of protest about uh, Black Lives Matter was a really good example of when people get inspired to get involved. Uh, and I think the um, extinct rebellion was also another point where I think people found a bit of a political voice. But then you'd have to ask your next question: Is there somewhere that they can place that political voice for them to to go forward with? Um, yeah. And, you know, I, um, you know, I think there's part of this is is the down to us to educate students as much as we can about our systems. But I think there is also a responsibility of our politicians to inspire, um, and you know, inspire debate, um, but also inspire debate that's respectful, and you know, you can shake the hand of the person at the end of it, and you know, uh, I do worry a little bit about how black and white everything has become in terms of you're either on this side or this side and yeah. kind of the nuance has gone a little bit. And so I think that's important as something we do need to teach students in school, that yeah. the world is actually a shades of grey rather than an absolute definite black and white 
I mean, I like to see it as more colourful opposed to black, white or grey. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I think, look, I mean, I know you're talking about the inspiration and like certain kids aren't inspired by it. But there's certain kids that aren't inspired by history, maths, English. I mean, you, you can argue that for every subject. Right. And um, what, what my sometimes my worry is kids just leaving school and not being prepared. But ultimately, let's, on, on the flip side, it's, it's that bridging the gap between school and the, and the workplace. Right. So. The, what, what my worry is that we're not doing that. There's millions of children every year that slip through the cracks that aren't given those opportunities because they might not be academically like adequate or whatever. I mean, they might not, it doesn't matter how hard they work, they'll only ever get C's. And there are, I mean, that's absolutely fine. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't like say that they're not, they haven't worked hard, but actually as an employer, an employer doesn't want anyone average, right? So what are we doing to make sure that we give those kids an opportunity to not just the ones that are going to do well academically? Well, I think, um, you know, that you, you are right. That is down to us as, in schools to inspire them in different ways. And that's the reason why we do do um, public speaking and the reason why we do do um, uh, reading poetry out loud and so on, because it's an important skill that you need to learn for life. Um, do we capture that in a way that's effective in terms of their next steps and employers? No, the, probably the last time that we did it was probably the record of achievement. It was, a, you know, that's quite a long time ago now. You know, I think it's really important that, that everybody is seen in the whole, you know, as, as a person. But, you know, we both know as employers that you look at a CV and, you, you know, you're doing your first sift. And sometimes it does come down to the academics of the, of, of the person. You know, I, I have to say that I tend to spend a long time reading their letter. That, to me, is the bit that I really focus in on. And I'm not... Um, you know, the letter is, tends to be the thing that I really do select from. But we know that there are certain employers that won't even look at a student unless they've gone to a, a, a Russell Group University and have got a first class honours degree from that Russell Group University. And we know there are employers that then look back at the A-level grades to do their next sift. And then, you know, they go back to the GCSE grades as their third sift. And then it's what school they went to is their, you know, and that's part of the problem is until we get a system outside of school, which in some way enables people to be selected beyond the CD. You know, I think that's part of it. But I don't disagree with you that we as, a, as educators need to think about developing the whole person. Um, and it's, you know, part of my uh, vision for this school, and I've, I've just started, and this is part of the process this year in terms of um, working with the teachers and the students and the parents and the local community, is what is it that we think is a great school? What is it the things that should happen uh, in a great school? And I, I know, you know, from anything that from parents in the main, it's not just academic outcomes. You know, they do want the best for their own child, but they're not particularly interested in the aggregated um, outcomes. They do want great sport and they do want great performing arts. And, you know, and I think that's so important. And I'm always reminded of this when we, when we talk about curriculum, about School 21 and how Peter Hyam has set up that school with the head, the heart and the hand. And I think that encapsulates perfectly the way that we should be thinking about our, our curriculum. It should be along those, those lines. But until we get a visionary um, who sets up the accountability measures that thinks about things beyond a set of academic results, it's going to be very hard because ultimately a good school is deemed by a set of an aggregation of results from a group of students. Absolutely. I mean, but I, I, absolutely. And, and you're right. I mean, it would be lovely if it came from the top and there was a better system in place, but ultimately is there a level of like kind of your moral obligation to these kids? And then the kind of the, on the flip side, you having to do certain things to tick boxes for Ofsted or the framework or to, to look good on league tables. I mean, cause like there, there must be a conflict of interest in there somewhere, right? Yeah, but you have to look yourself in the mirror. You know, ultimately, uh, as a leader, you have to look yourself in the mirror. And if you're, if, if you think that um, the best outcomes are the only uh, be all and end all for your school, and you bend the rules or you bend the curriculum or you do things because it gives you a, um, a an outcome, well, you're the person that needs to look in the mirror at the end of the day. That's not why I came into education. That's not the reason that I am here. Um, I've always had, um, since I've been a leader, a very paternalistic view of what, you know, my 
job is. And that is that, you know, in old fashioned term, it is tough love that, it, you know, life is hard. And sometimes, you know, the fact that I, you know, that we say no is actually really important for young, for young people. Absolutely. But I, but I, I want them to grow as people. I want them to be listened to. I want them to think that there are adults in this world who will listen. And one of the um, centre parts of my um, uh, leadership of this school is that I absolutely promise the students that I will listen. Uh, and the same for the staff. You know, they'll always get some time from me where I will listen. I may not agree with them in terms of how they perceive something has happened. They, I, you know, I may not agree with them in terms of whether they should have a sanction or not have a sanction, but they know that I'll always listen. And very quickly that um, has been appreciated by lots of um, students here. Um, I just also feel that I, I owe them as, a, as someone who's paternalistic about this, I owe them the best chance they possibly can have in the next stage, which means that I do want them to work as hard as possible on whether we, we think it's a flawed set of exams or a great set of exams. I want them to be as successful as they possibly can because you and I both know that in the current system, that is their passport to the next, the next stages. So, but I do believe there's a balance. Yeah. And I do believe that actually having um, happy staff and happy students is a really good way to get them to perform at their best. 100%. I mean, if, if a child is, is upset, they're not going to learn as much as, as if they were happy, right? It's about clearing up the, the mind to actually learn and inspiring them to want to learn, right? And it's not going to happen if they're going for a bad place emotionally. And yep. I, I mean, we all, do, we all go for it, but it's about how do we kind of get, help them deal with it and actually make sure that they're still focused on the learning. I think listening is, an, is, a, is a massive part of that. Um, but again, like it goes back to kind of the exams, right? I mean, we, we do all of that. I mean, you, you as a head teacher are doing certain things, but actually when we talk about giving these kids the best chance possible, some, again, some of these kids will work hard, but still not get the grades that they need to do what they need to do, you know, but some yeah. of those kids might be really good. I mean, they might really understand the information, but might just be bad at exams. I mean, what are we, what like in not incorporating oral presentation as a form of assessment in some way, I'm not saying get rid of exams completely, but surely for some of those children that, can't do well with exams and 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 have talent. Are we doing them a disservice and closing doors by not having other options of uh, other ways of uh, other forms of assessment? I think again, it's it's a it's a difficult one because it, because ultimately it comes back to the accountability system. The reason we don't have other forms of assessment is because they were deemed to be unreliable, and they were deemed to be unreliable for the accountability measure. You know, so um, BTECs, um, which I think are really great courses uh, and have real merit in terms of the way those courses are run, now have an exam. And they have an exam because they were deemed not to be reliable enough. Mm -hmm. um, and the reliability is not so much for the single student. The reliability is for the league tables. You know, they want to make sure that my my set of GCSE results are equivalent to everybody else's set of GCSE results. Um, and then, of course, people found ways of um, utilising that system that gave them an advantage. So we, def we definitely went through a period where schools were offering one BTEC, English and Maths, and those schools would get 70 odd percent, you know, 5A star to C, including English and Maths. And, you know, that's how the school was doing really well. Morally, you know, I just think that's an absolute disgrace, but that's how some schools change the way that the, the community perceived them. Do I believe there should be different ways of, of, of assessing students? Absolutely. Do I think that um, the way that we assess students at GCSE is right? No, I don't think it is. Um, but ultimately I don't have that power to change that system. So I've got to make sure that I prepare the students in such a way that we look after them, that they understand that hard work and stressful moments are life. Yeah. Uh, and that we get them in a, in a place where they can perform, you know, at their best. And we, you know, in your line of work, you have moments where you need to present to clients. You, you will have a moment where this is a big contract that we could win here. Yeah. And we've got to nail this presentation. And so in that regard, preparing for exams is probably not a bad, realistic view of what's going to happen in that moment. The difference is the way that you're going to present that information is going to be different in comparison to an exam. 
you know, if I was going to change it, it would be the accountability measures. And if the accountability measures were different, then we wouldn't have all of this issue about um, how exams are run, how assessments are run, uh, whether one school is doing something that another school is not. You know, I, I had a th think about this a few years ago, and to me, the obvious thing is destination. You know, what are the destinations of the students from your school? You know, can you do that over a, a number of years so that you can actually see beyond your school gates, you know, what kind of uh, colleges they went to after that, what kind of jobs did they go into? And then you can kind of look at your holistic part of your school education, which I thought would be a nice way of doing it, but it needs a politician. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, look, ultimately, I think about the accountability. I think, yeah, you, you're right. We do need accountability, but I, seriously, I, I, I believe that our current accountability system isn't actually like measuring the right things. I know for certain children it is, and in some respects, it does show schools like providing producing results. But like statistics show that those children that come from disadvantaged backgrounds that go to Russell Group universities, up to thirty percent of them drop out in their first year. Yeah. So I mean that isn't actually representing in the data that we're actually providing for being provided by schools, right? And actually, mm -hmm. what we're we measuring success with just just that they get really good results and they get into university. And actually, we all know that there's so much more to life than that. And if it was fifty yeah. years ago and there was only like jobs that were like you needed degrees for in terms of doctors, nurses, teachers teachers, lawyers, those kind of like really highly regarded like professions. I mean, that'd be fair enough, but 50 years on, there's so many independent companies, there's so much innovation, there's always new industries that are forming. So actually, in my opinion, we are almost doing a bit of a disservice to some of these children because what we're saying is academics is, is the be all and end all. If you take BTEC or T levels, you're perceived not to be as smart as the other children. And actually, we need to be looking at the fact that there was 226,000 job vacancies that didn't have the right skill labor for it. You know, I mean, it's like education should be evolving to fit the world and the workplace. And actually right now we're, we're still very much in the first industrial revolution in the way that we are educated, you know, with the subjects. And I'm not trying to discredit what teachers are doing and what schools are doing, because I know we're going above and beyond to try to actually give children an opportunity, but year in, year out, millions of children fall through this, fall, fall through their cracks. And, mm -hmm. And actually, we keep doing the same thing every year and expecting different results. You know, we, we, every year we talk about reducing the gap between the advantage and the disadvantage, yet we keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. I mean, is yeah. it for a bit more of a radical change and, and for us to start looking at ways that we can help those children that are from disadvantage or poorer backgrounds that like only ever achieve C's, but to still give them opportunities beyond school? Yeah, you you know, I, I I would shove you off your soapbox and, and stand there and talk talk in the, in the same regard as, as you do in in regards to this. It is it is not working for lots of our students in terms of the way that we that we operate. Um, and this is where the study of other education systems become really interesting. And that that idea of um, making sure that the students all reach a certain level by a certain point. And then there's the separation in terms of the direction that they, they go at. So at no point are these students deemed to be um, uh, failing. Everyone's got to reach that point. Everyone reaches that point. And then there's the opportunities for the students who want to go off and be academic or the students who want to go off and be um, doctors and lawyers and so on. Whilst at the same time recognising that I don't want a plumber who can't logically work the problem out before they start ripping my floors up. You know, yeah. I don't want... You know, I don't want someone who can't problem solve effectively to, to look at my electrics in my house. You know, these are the these are the crucial parts. And that intelligence is a form of intelligence, albeit not someone who's good at possibly sitting down and doing a set of exams. You know, yeah. Um, uh, and, I, you know, I, I just fundamentally agree with you um, that as a school leader, I have to operate within the system that I'm that I am in, and I have to make sure that what I'm doing is the absolute best that I possibly can for every student. So, how do we do that within the system that we've got? Well, we we listen, you know, and it comes back to that part again of finding out from young people what it is and what their skill sets are, and what you know, and finding those little moments of success. So today we had a non-screen. Uh, day um, today so we were looking at mental well-being of students and we were talking about different things you can do to support your resilience and your well-being and within the community schools we did a whole series of different things and I, I met a student today that I've not really met 
in the time that I've been here. It's a student that tends to be in our inclusion unit or tends to be uh, working with our SEND um, staff. And I saw him today in one task really start to work it out and start to become quite resilient. And he had to practice it a few times to get it right. And then out of the whole group that we had in today, which is about 80 kids, he came second. Wow. And I think that for him is the first time for him that he's ever done anything in school where he's been successful. Now, I've now built a relationship with that young, uh, young man that I wouldn't have had the chance to do. Uh, and that's part of what we've got to try and do. We've got to get them to understand that there are different ways of thinking, there are different ways of working, and there are people out there who do want the best for them and do want them to do, to do really well. So I kind of realised I've rattled on a little bit. The, the, the system doesn't work at this moment in time. Um, uh, the whole gap between academia and uh, skills doesn't work in terms of that we perceive one to be much higher than the other one. Um, the way that we operate assessment systems doesn't work. The, you know, the breadth <laughs> of our curriculum is enormous. Um, and, you know, that's really quite hard for young people to get their heads around. So that doesn't work. But you need a you need a politician who will who will stand up and say what I'm about to do won't really have impact for ten years, but I'm doing it so that in ten years time the young people we're developing in school start to come out like this, <laughs> um, and that's been the issue for the I think for probably the last fifty years of education policy in the UK is, is that pretty much it's been trying to maintain the relationship with the middle classes um, you know and that was grammar schools for quite a long time and then it became grammar schools again um, and then people tried to use anecdotal evidence to say that this is the reason why it's, a, it's, the, mo it's the driver of social mobility and every single piece of research study that's ever been done has proven the opposite about grammar schools that they have no impact whatsoever in social mobility um, and yet comprehensive schools have been berated over a number of years because they feel that we drag the top end down and create like a going back to your being more colorful create a gray middle of people that are kind of a bit all right at some things but not everything else um, I think in a really long-winded answer I think I've basically just agreed with you but at the same time I'm a pragmatist and therefore I need to make sure that whatever I do here um, does create great rounded individuals, but at the, sort, at the same time gives them the best chance that I can give them at doing well in those exams. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult one. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily want to be a head teacher in your position because I think... Like for me, I mean, it, it, I, the reason why I couldn't be a head teacher is because I feel like there'd be so many restrictions in what I believe is going to help children. I mean, look, I, there is an importance of academics. I'm not taking that away. And I think sometimes it comes across as if I don't believe that there, there, there is a place for exams or academic knowledge. There's always going to be a place for it. And I think knowledge has always got to be the starting point. My, again, going back to what I said earlier, I mean, I feel like sometimes education is a destination because it doesn't matter what you've learned over the five years. It's all got to be summed up in that one exam at, when you're 16, you know, um, yeah. and it's, it's it's bonkers, you know, I mean, like actually like helping a kid find their niche and finding what they're good at. It, it, it's not about that. It's all about giving them the basic skills, then then they're on to the next part of their journey. And actually, yeah. like, what, what is the purpose of education? That's what the, like, you beg that question, don't you? Is it fit for purpose? And I know you kind of said no, but I mean, what are we, what are we doing about it? You know, I mean, like it's, it's, I understand that it's hard until a politician comes into play, but our education secretary has a lifespan of two years and it's been like that for the last 20 years. So, mm -hmm. At what point do we say enough's enough like and, and we need to take the power of education back or we need a 10-year budget where we can plan education to make it like so we can invest in the right places and even though we might have a lesser budget at least we know what we can invest in and how to work our budgets and and actually work with schools around the country to to move education forward i mean is there a, do we need to get to that point um, yeah, but we're in we're in a um, a uh, climate at the moment where um, you have to make a decision whether you're a progressive or a, or a traditionalist, you know. And um, for a number of years, the progressive voices were heard the highest, um, and that failed, you know. Uh, and then we've got traditionalists or 
um, that are now being heard quite heavily because that's the way the government tends to take their ear in terms of education policy. And I wouldn't say, as we both discussed, that the, the, the system that we have is correct, although it's very traditional. Um, but that nuance of, of, of the middle part of thinking about what it is that we're trying to do is difficult because, um, you know, um, I listened to your podcast with Catherine um, and, you know, there's lots of things that Catherine says that I fundamentally completely agree with, you know, in terms of some of the issues that we've had in this country is having low expectations of people yeah. from, from poor backgrounds. And actually, if we have really high expectations, then we can enable those young people to, to be successful. But ultimately, I don't think it's it's so much anymore about um, where you live or what type of house that you live in. It's actually to do with quite a lot with the drive of your own family and your own, you know, your own parents. Uh, I, I worked in uh, Hastings as an area of really high deprivation. Um, and yet, you know, you can tell the students whose parents are interested in their, you know, in their schooling and their lives and so on. And you do meet the, the, the odd student that falls off you know, um, even with that kind of background. But in the main, the students that we're talking about here that don't grasp the opportunities that are given tend to be the ones that just don't have that support mechanism at, at home. So coming back to your point, it's a much bigger issue in terms of making sure that we are uh, enabling all students to um, have the best opportunity they can in their education system for them to grow and develop and show the skills that they've got, which then enable them to, to move on and, uh, and be successful um, later on. You know, there was a documentary recently about breaking into the elite, uh, you know, and really sitting down with young people who deem to be successful, you know, straight A star, A levels, gone to the best universities in the land, but couldn't break into the jobs that they went they wanted to get because they just didn't have the background they didn't have the language and have the communication skills that children from different backgrounds had um, and when you believe as much as I do that there is an element here that education is meant to be is meant to give every child the, the same opportunity um, and we've got a system that's completely imbalanced in that regard you know in terms of the opportunities that uh, a student my, at my school will get in comparison to a student who goes to Eton or get, you know, it's it's built in. So do I think there needs to be a radical change? Completely. Um, do I think that within my lifetime that radical change will happen? Probably not. And so where do I sit at this moment in time? I come back to it, doing the absolute best that I possibly can do with every student I, that comes through my doors and also having an eye on making sure that um, the impact that we have on our community is as positive as we can possibly make it. And so we do break down some of those barriers with some families and we do do our best to support families who are, who are struggling. Um, but ultimately, you know, that's society needs to get on top of some of those things and enable us to, to, to um, teach students. Yeah. Um, so it, it sounds like a very um, cop out answer which is, I agree with you, but I'm going to carry on working within this system um, because ultimately, you know, that's my, that's my job. Whether the, what will be interesting is in, is in 20, well, 10 years time, 15 years time, where the students who are currently in year 12 and the students who are currently in year 11 suddenly start to come into the positions of power, suddenly start to take up those positions and they, they would have been, they would have felt like second class citizens for most of their adult life. Oh, you were the year of the pandemic. Oh, you didn't really get your GCSE grades. Oh, you didn't really get your A-level grades. And suddenly they'll reach a point where they're in power and maybe they might be the generation that goes, well, hang on a minute, I've still been successful. I've still moved my life forward. Um, I used those skills that I was never examined on to be successful. Um, and Perhaps we do need to start looking at the education system. Why have I got all these people that are older than me saying, you know, you know, your education is not worth as much as mine? And maybe mm. they might be the generation that changed the whole thing. I would like to say by that point, I would like to be retired. So uh, <laughs> I, I can, I can, I can certainly help them from the outside. But um, you know, the one thing you have to take positives when when you're dealing with moments like we have done that 
those young people will they'll take this forward and this will be a, such a part of their their growth into adults that actually they might fundamentally change things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just going back to kind of when you started the point, you said you agree with Catherine Burr about thing about high expectations. I mean, I don't, I don't dispute that, but I think with, with Catherine sometimes it's very black and white. I mean, you can't have one, you have to have one or the other. Whereas I believe that you, why, why can't you have both? Why can't you have high expectations, but still be able to do the academic, to do the emotional intelligence regulation, to do, I mean, I think a big part of what we need to be doing, especially for these children that have missed out on so much like education, yeah is then we need to bring leadership and entrepreneurship into it because we have more independent and independent companies we have them more than ever right i mean you really need to look at estate agents 20 yeah. years ago, there's one in every town now there's one in every corner you know and mm -hmm. because everyone wants the flexibility they want work-life balance they want to own their own company i mean why aren't we preparing children to be able to leave school with that mindset and and the ability to actually start a business I mean, a lot of times now we can just like literally network on social media like LinkedIn and we don't even need to start up on marketing costs. You know, like why aren't we teaching kids how to network and actually build a portfolio of people that they can work with? You know? Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I would say that we do attempt, you know, to make sure that students understand that. Um, my background is economics and I've been a business studies teacher for most of my career. So I think entrepreneurship is a, is a vital part of what we teach young people you know i used to spend the whole time years ago when when i used to watch it shouting at the screen at the apprenticeship with them not being able to calculate costs <laughs> and then the same and, and, the, and the same thing with dragon's den when you know someone offers you um a hundred thousand pounds for nothing and you're 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 arguing over a percentage of the ownership when you haven't got anything you know i just <laughs> Those, those parts of um, entrepreneurship, I think, are really important. You know, um, Levi Roots, you know, look at that guy. Yeah, he know, smashed he, it. As soon as, soon as, as Peter Jones said, I'll offer you £50,000 for, you know, 50% of your business. You went, yeah, great. Because 50% of the business with Peter Jones on side is a multi-million pound business. Yeah. Whereas before, he had a, you know, a, a business that was coming out of his kitchen. You know, and I, I think those kinds of elements of students understanding those things are really important. But it, it's where this is really interesting is um, a few years ago, I had to really think about how I taught business studies because um, business studies at GCSE is based on case studies. Um, and case studies, you have to have quite an old head on to get it, you know, because it's not something that's obvious. You know, when, when you have um, a, a, a business that's a kebab shop and the question is about marketing and the students put TV adverts, you know, because it's right, you know, adverts, TV adverts are a really good way to market a business. But that connection back to it's a small business, they can't afford that. So you need to tone it down in terms of where you're going. That's quite an old head. And so um, that understanding of metacognition was the real moment where it opened it up to me. And so we would spend, you know, lesson after lesson going through case studies with me explaining every part of how I was thinking until they could do it. And, you know, they, they did it with scaffolding. Then we did it with a little bit without scaffolding. And we did it with no scaffolding. So they, I could really get to the point where they understood it. Um, and that is part of what we should be doing in terms of education. And I completely agree with you about um, being able to understand your emotions and be able to control your emotions as part of this and being able to look someone in the eye and shake their hand and that well, at one point we'll be able to shake hands again but you know eye contact being so important um, you know um, I remember someone saying to me it's not all about looks and for everything that we do as humans you know we make snap decisions in two seconds so no matter what we think and how we think we should do it you do need to put a tie on for an interview and you, you do need to make sure you've tidied your hair and all of those basic things that I was taught as a kid by my dad, you know, there's part of that's what we come into school now. And that's the part that I think we come back to a little bit is part of the missing generation in some ways is, is um, some of the skills that my dad and his dad and passed down and, you know, um, lots of people that I know that had um, families that really cared for them, but wanted them to do well and made sure that they, you know, understood the fact of getting up early and working hard and, you know, taking on things without asking for extra pay. Because, you know, at some point down, down the line, that becomes an advantage to you. 
I think some of that is also missing as well as things that we can do better as, as schools. I think there's a there's a generation out there that haven't quite got that and so therefore they don't pass that on to their to their children. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely bang on. I think it's, it's hard, isn't it, for a head teacher? But I think, is, is, it, is, it, is it time for a head teacher just to say, look, I, I need to do it my way and, and break free from what is expected and actually have more autonomy to, to actually impact the children in the way they feel is best? Yeah, but I take you back to the accountability measures. You know, whatever, whichever way, and this is what the idea behind free schools, and there were some really interesting free schools that came out of it. And I would say Michaela is one of those schools yeah. that's really interesting. But at the same time, I also think that School 21 is really, is really yeah. interesting. And both of them were born, the out, of the that, yeah, were born out of that idea of uh, autonomy and coming up with your own ideas and so on and so forth. And academies were always very much about you can teach your own curriculum and you can make sure that the curriculum that you teach suits your community and the, and the people that you're, you're working with. But ultimately, if you're not teaching what's going to happen in those exams, you know, your accountability measure is going to be low. Um, and then you'll get the call from your governors about the concern that they have about your um, outcomes. And then the local authority, if it's a local authority or your trust, will start to check on why you are not getting the accountability measures that you should be getting. And then you'll have Ofsted arrive and say, this isn't good enough. Um, we like all the stuff that you're doing in terms of oracy and so on and so forth, but not enough kids are passing the GCSEs at the end of it. And then you haven't got a job anymore. That's a problem, though, isn't so, it? That's a, that's a systemic well, failure, isn't it? It's difficult because it's one part of me completely. It's 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 a failure, but the other part of me thinks, well, we need the accountability because I think schooling and education is is light years ahead of what I what I received in the in the eighties, um, where they did have a lot of autonomy, and I'm really worried about outcomes. And you know, I was one of those kids that could go either way, and right. I could have done so much better in school if I'd have just had a group of teachers that one understood how to teach learning and two were quite willing to, you know, kick me down the road a little bit at times because I needed to get on with the work I was meant to be doing. So I think accountability has helped in some of those ways, but then you do need a way of measuring somehow what ability ranges people have at the end of it. So if I'm doing a school where we're not doing any exams, if I'm doing a school where it's all about emotional regulation and um, being able to speak in public and having confidence, when those kids go out, how will you measure that as an employer? How will you know the types of students that you are getting? When you've got um, yeah, but, 18, 18, 18, schools? The problem is, though, I still don't know. I mean, even with the current metrics, I yeah. don't know. So, I mean... No, 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 I, no. I mean, and the thing, again, it goes back to the point where actually, I understand we have to have some metrics, but actually it should be yeah. student-centred about kind of the progress they're making and where we need to work on them and help them, right? Not actually yeah. about holding schools accountable in some respect. It should be very student-centred. And I mean, you've got the high stakes accountability is in comparison to Premier League managers in some respects in, in, in the way that you're kind of like fired and hired and, and, and like the processes in terms of accountability. But actually, what yeah. about the accountability of being good people, showing love, showing compassion, showing empathy? I mean, what, what about those metrics? Are those not important? If we want a world in the future that is, is, is a better world, that we are, don't have like things like George Floyd's murder and like those, those things that are happening in the real world with those difficult conversations why, what, I mean, why aren't we measuring that? You know, that's just as important as just like doing well in the exam, right? Yeah, but I, again, I don't disagree and I don't think it's, it's completely in conflict with the way that, that lots of us run schools. I think there are lots of schools that become famous um, for reasons that I don't think is right. Um, you know, the, the flattening of the grass um, concept that came out a year and a bit ago um, no, it, it is about the whole part. It is about the love that we can show young people and the love that we can show our communities about the care that we that we have for them. Um, but to me, that comes back to the paternalistic element again, which yeah. is, is also, I, I do, I am going to listen to you. I understand that there are things that are going on in your life that you need to talk through and therefore sitting in all these lessons are a pointless exercise because you've got so much running around in the back of your head 
Yeah, absolutely. It is down to me to set up um, systems and processes where we can rescue those those young people. Um, and I remember was, uh, there was the adage about, you know, what we're, what we're currently doing in education in, in regards to that is we're picking the kids out at the bottom of the waterfall. And actually what we should be doing is all the work at the, at the top of the river rather than that side. But that's the way that I set up my school. So my school is about that we have to understand that every young person is coming to us from a different background. What I say, though, that's a reason for behaviour, but it's not an excuse for behaviour. You know, and so, yes, when you get an angry child in front of you, you have to regulate because if you give anger to anger, it, you know, we all know where that ends up. And that's part of what we do here. It is about the love of, of, of the work that we do and having that unconditional uh, positive regard for the students in our care. But ultimately, <laughs> they're going to get judged somewhere down the line in terms of the amount of GCSEs that they can get. Mental. For me, yeah, but for me, it is partly that, but it's also making sure that um, whatever happens, the students under our care get the best destination that we can possibly work for them. And in that case, it can be making sure that they've got the best college place that they, they go for. I think I've judged myself as when I bump into those young people, you know, five years down the line, the ones that have been really difficult. And, you know, you have really good conversations with them. You're able to have, to have a conversation with them and that you're not, um, you know, they quite often will say, oh, God, what an idiot I was at school, you know, but you can have that conversation. And that shows a mark of them understanding what you were trying to do with them without the fact that you were trying to roll them into some form of sausage that then it's not going to be in terms of that model. But I, I you, that, Dave Whitaker uh, and the psychology of um, unconditional positive regard, I think, is is really important, and that's the bit that comes back to listening. Just taking a moment, no matter how busy you are, just listening to what they're telling you. And sometimes it's a big pack of lies, and sometimes it's you know just an excuse to get out of doing something. But um, I know over my career is you break down so many of the barriers with young people by just taking that time to listen. Um, and they end up having respect for you when you say no, because they kind of go, OK, we well, has listened. You still say no. And I don't want to go to this detention, but at least I've had my my time to, to say why I don't think that's right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, 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 I think obviously you've got the right approach and I think. It's, it's just unfortunate we've got certain systems in place that probably doesn't allow you to explore that a little bit more. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, like in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, in a perfect world, if, if there were less systems in place, do you, would you do things different? And like, do you feel like you could have more of a positive impact on some of these kids? Yeah, I mean, if they're, well, first and foremost, I'd make sure that um, we solve the social issues that we need to solve. Um, I think that there are, you know, as an economist, I've always had great concern about the fact that in our benefit system or our voucher system, whatever it's called now, that any kind of gumption is is penalised. Anything to, to kind of get yourself going and working is penalised within that system. Um, and therefore, um, we do have generations of people that just don't work because if they do any day's work, then they lose everything. You know, the housing benefit, everything goes. Uh, and I think you have to solve some of that. So it takes um, that people understand that doing a few hours work a week is better because you've got more money coming in. Doing even more hours a week is better because you've got more money coming in. And then at some point, you might not need some of these benefits that you're getting because you're earning enough money. Mm. Um, but, you know, forget taxing these people and go to a positive taxation system that there comes a moment where you switch from one to the other. So instead of taking out the system, you're giving back into the system. I think that would be, you know, there's, there's my radical idea for, for a Friday afternoon. Uh, there's no doubt. If I could design the system, I would have a system where we would ensure that our curriculum was um, uh, narrowed in lots of, in lots of ways um, in terms of the amount of things that we're trying, get, trying to get students to learn as, they, as they're with us. I would ensure that maths was much more realistic in terms of what students need for their lives. And I would have a really big emphasis on statistics because I think 
you need to know when people are lying to you outside. And I think, you know, too many of us uh, don't understand how statistics work and therefore uh, sometimes we're bombarded with them. We don't really understand them. I think that's a really important part. I would really make sure that finance and percentages was part of that uh, learning. I think English, again, um, I think the work that we've done on reading and literature just continues because I think it's really good. And I think the joy of reading should be part of what we're teaching them rather than you're going to do this as an exam at the end of it. And, you know, let's kill the joy out of reading this book. So just, then on, I would, just on that, sorry. I mean, do we need to, like, help these children read books in things that they actually enjoy to get that love of reading? Because sometimes I feel like we're thrown off mice and men, Shakespeare, and actually some of these kids, they just don't relate to it. And I never, I, like, if I, during school, I didn't enjoy reading. I mean, it's only recently yeah. that I've, I've got into Simon Sinek and I've really started to read his books. But, it, like, yeah. some kids just don't enjoy what, what's being taught. So do we need to have more variety in terms of the books that we're, we're giving to these kids? Well, but that's something that we do again. You know, we make sure that we are thinking about the types of books that students are reading and the way that they want to read them. You know, I do uh, it, Shakespeare in its purest form. Um, I struggle with, you know, I even though I, I did English literature A level, um, I still uh, find uh, Shakespeare a bit impenetrable when you see it at the theatre. But you've got to see it at the theatre. Um, and I think there are ways and means of teaching Shakespeare in a really effective way. And I, I saw it at one of the schools that I worked in at GLF. And Shakespeare in year seven was all about the spoken language, was all about the history uh, and the rich history that was going on, was around it. But it was abridged. So it was about the story, you know, and, you know, and it was about the reason why it was rhyming couplets and the reason why it's in that language and all the things that are hard. But it was getting them to really love the story and getting them, you know, to, to really think about what was going on in those stories. I mean, I always used to talk about uh, with young people who wouldn't engage about Macbeth being about the most gory gangster movie that I could possibly imagine. If you film that as a gangster movie, you know, I think you would struggle to get a low um, uh, rating for it. But I think the storytelling of it is so important. Um, and, and I think for literature, it is about sometimes you, you challenge yourself in terms of the books that you read. Um, but I think there is a um, community benefit of having that understanding of Shakespeare and the time of Shakespeare. So, you know, I don't agree that everything has to be aligned to the student. And sometimes you do need to challenge a student in terms of the way that they're thinking, because would I have read the books that I read without reading books that I didn't like? You know, I had to read French Lieutenant's Woman as my A-level, one of my A-level texts. And I could not stand that novel for about 30 chapters. And then something clicked and it, I, you know, it became a novel that I absolutely loved. But I had to drag myself through it. And because of that, you know, I do drag myself through some novels, hoping that they'll turn. And then but I do give up and they're not very good. But I would then have a system that didn't have GCSEs. <laughs> and I would, you know, the, the come, yeah. Yes. So I would remove, I would remove GCSEs, but I would have a moment at the age of fifteen. So really, the end of year ten would be my moment where that would be the, the kind of looking at where they're going to head to next, and then then you would have your academic A levels, uh, and then you would have your um, fantastic uh, vocational uh, advanced level courses. So they are advanced level, but they're that they're much more um, designed for students who are heading towards university courses in engineering or in um, uh, speech therapy or uh, nursing. I think you could really think about that group of, of courses. I think the T-levels in public service is probably part of that. And then you would really start to think about how we um, encourage students to not only take vocational skills as an as a option, but also really give that some work in terms of the MBQs that they can do after that and really having some equivalency to where you could get within in skills um, that society felt it was really worthwhile you know and um, if I wanted to get the plumbing of my house completely changed I could get a, a young newly qualified plumber or I could ring up the master craftsman know that I'm going to have to pay a little bit more but know that 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 qualification guarantees a level of work and a level of uh, standard um, so that's where I would that's where I would radically change everything 
Um, unfortunately, I'm too old to go into politics. Um, and so, you're, yeah, I think it's, it's you youngsters now that need to need to try and <laughs> push forward with it. I mean, it's, uh, you come up with some really good ideas. And I think overall, like the, the, the variety of being able to give children options, I think that's ultimately what we really need to be looking at, because yeah. some people are just really good at certain things. Some are just excellent at other things you know and it's i think we have a, a, a duty in some respects as as a school system to make sure we're giving every child an opportunity to succeed at their their full potential you know not just to coast them through to the exams um but uh, i mean yeah i mean I, I love your suggestions just on just to finish things off if there was a radical change if there was a group of people that were moving education forward would you join the revolution um it's going to speak honestly with you. I tried that in my first headship and um, I felt that and I got involved in the National Baccalaureate and I got involved in the Heads Round Table and I really loved the people that I met through that and I met lots of people that made me feel that I wasn't mad as a head teacher in terms of the way that I felt. Yeah. Um, you know, so I met Vic Goddard and Dave Whitaker and Tom Sheridan um, and Duncan Spaulding. You know, these people that um, I've had the opportunity to meet and really discuss education and, and, and understand that. But I lost focus a little bit. And my everything that I'm doing at the moment is focused on this school. And, mm -hmm. and everything I want to do is about making this school a great, a true, I, I talk about this being a truly great school. And I talk about that because the students um, feel that they are uh, looked after and they're happy and they enjoy school and we help them bring out the skills and the, and the, uh, and the aptitudes that will help them for the rest of their lives. Um, and through that, they get great destinations. And whether that's, you know, students who head off towards the best universities in the world or it's students who go off into colleges but have the resilience to be able to deal with some of the things that they will meet along their way. That parents are happy that their kids are here. You know, and it's something that they, you know, will say to other people, um, you know, I'm just so glad that my child is at Alexandra. Um, the staff love working here and are happy. Um, and that our local community see us as um, a beacon of the, of the area. And that's academically and musically and um, artistically and production wise and sporting everything. That's that's what I want to, to create here. And. To do that, you need to give it 100% of your attention. However, once I've retired, once I've retired, then you've got me, and I'll, I'll be, I'll be on the, I'll be on the front line with you. I get that. I mean, but obviously there, there are still some kids that might not kind of excel in the system that you got, right? I know you try to do everything you can, but uh, hypothetically, if there was going to be an evolution in the system, in the education system, that was going to allow you to embrace certain techniques that would help those kids too. I mean, is that something that you'd want to see happen before the time you retire? Yeah, uh, but you know, I don't think it, it, I don't think it's something I'm not trying and not aware of. Yeah. So we do have um, specialists in the school that help students manage their their emotions, and we do have um, different ways of approaching certain students in terms of um, supporting them. Um, you know, with some young people, it's about inspiring them. I've got a, a young, uh, I've got a year ten student who hasn't had the greatest school life up until this point. But she, she, she got me in all sorts of difficult corners in a debate that we had when I first met her. And I just went, this is a lawyer. You know, oh, my goodness, this is someone who needs to think about law. And, and that's what we talk about now. And she wants to be, go on to, to law and to be a barrister. And that would be the first person from her family that's done that. Um, and that comes back to listening again. So um, I do think there's lots of things that we can do here um, that, supports the whole the whole child but I come back to that paternalistic part of it again and being a being um, a parent is wanting the absolute best for the young people in your care and that means that it's tough love at times and it's yeah. no's and it's no you know the consequence of this choice means this outcome happens consequences of good choices mean these good outcomes happen you know You've got to learn that those are really important things of life. And I think that's really important that, 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 that the students in my care know that I'm fair, know that I will listen, but know that they, there are consequences to their actions, good or bad. You know, and I say that all the time. 
you know, the choice not to leave a lesson because your mates left the lesson is a good choice. And out of that, you don't get the detention, you learn something, you're not behind. You know, I try and make it as positive as I possibly can for them. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. I mean, let's let's leave it there. I mean, we've gone through so much, but just before you go, I mean, is there anything you'd like to kind of get off your chest that you feel is important that we, we kind of need to cover? Um, I just think education debate is is great. And I've learned huge amounts over over time by listening to people that I possibly don't agree with. Um, uh, but I think, um, you know, keeping those debates, you know, calm and polite and I think is really important now, especially for young people that have seen that, you know, it appears that life is about shouting the loudest. Um, and, you know, uh, that's that great quote, isn't it? It's the, it's the um, there's the tyranny of a lack of nuance or, you know, it's that part of, you know, people just think that it's this side or it's this side and you can't take bits from both sides and think this is actually quite, yeah. you know, quite good. So I think if I could do anything, it would be getting everybody to start talking to each other a bit nicer. <laughs> well, my, I have the poster on my wall, which is work hard and be nice to people. That's my, that's my underlying thought process. If you could just get everybody in that regard, then the world would just be a better place. 100% and uh, yeah I agree I mean I, I absolutely believe in collaboration I mean it's the word I live by this year um, so yeah I couldn't agree with you more I think we learn so much from other people and just because we might be doing something really well it doesn't mean somebody else isn't doing something different that is also working really well and there's no reason why when the world is so small through technology now we can't learn, take nuggets from other people and, and bring yeah. them what we're doing you know i think we're missing a massive trick there i think it's starting to happen slowly but i think we're missing a, missing a massive trick there because if we can replicate what other people are doing and it's an easy to easy to share what we're doing mm -hmm. i mean and people can copy it and use it and, and adapt it to their school and their ethos i mean wouldn't that just kind of speed things up you know yeah well you know the, the simple part of it is is that i've been lucky in my life to travel reasonably amount and what can i tell you everyone's the same Basically, all of us are the same. We want the same kind of things. Um, we want people to be friendly and warm. We want people to be nice to us. Uh, you know, we want to have a laugh at times. You know, that, you know, wherever you go on the planet, you know, that's your basic setup. And so the, the situation that we see on social media and sometimes through the media, which always is placing one side against the other side, isn't actually naturally what we do. And I think that's the thing that we just need to keep remembering. Absolutely. I mean, we'll leave it there, Liam. I mean, thanks for obviously going through through like your views and your your kind of where you're at in terms of education. I mean, like, just obviously, yeah, thank you for coming on and everyone that's watching. Thank you for obviously watching. Um, Liam, it was, it was an absolute pleasure. Lovely to meet you. Take care.